Thank you, thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure to have you here today. You know, um, as I come up on the shuttle bus here today, um, it's a short distance, but there's a certain activation energy you have to get over to come up here for the day. And I think one of our goals here today is to uh, lower the the delta G star, right? Uh, the double G double double dagger. We want to decrease the activation energy and have more interchange between the amazing resources we have here in the arts and sciences school, the engineering school, the mathematics departments, physics departments, and the, the medical center. And part of this is learning to speak each other's language. Part of this is to understand some of the important clinical issues, not at the detailed level of a medical student or, a, or you know, another health professional, but enough to understand you know, why we're doing what we're doing down the medical center and why we need all of your help to try to take the most, you know, most advanced technologies to bring it to bear to improve human health through better diagnosis, through better treatment. So that's basically the theme here today. We have uh, four lectures. We have myself, we have Dr. White on imaging, we have uh, Dr. Kolesnik speaking about traditional uh, histology which was one of the earliest technologies, basically grew out of chemistry. Histology grew out of the discovery of aniline dyes and being able to dye wool. And then someone said, why don't we dye uh, tissues? And you know, put a dye on a tissue and then they look on the microscope and you see things. And the word that our, our PSOC focuses on chromatin, which was named because it was colorful. The nucleus had this colorful, colorful uh, material called chromatin. So, Basically, uh, we all start with uh, fundamental chemistry in the modern diagnostic era. And our last discussion will be on biomarkers, kind of an elusive term, but what we would mean is some kind of stand-in that would allow us to predict who will do well with a therapy and who will do poorly, who should get a specific treatment and who should not. These would be the, the biomarkers. So um, with that, I'm going to start today. I'm going to talk, I'm going to kind of merge uh, the topic of genomic technologies with the subject I know well and I'll teach you some more about, which is about neoplasms of the white blood cell lineage, what, which we call particularly the myeloid lineage. When we talk about white cells, we can think about lymphoid cells that make antibodies, those are B cells. We can think about immune cells that are part of delayed type hypersensitivity, like skin rashes, those are T cells. They are also involved in organ rejection. And then we could talk about the cells that make pus, basically, which are granulocytes, cells that are uh, adapted to fight bacteria by uh, arming, them, arming themselves with a number of antibacterial peptides. They create a lot of peroxide and douse bacteria with peroxide to try to kill them. These are pus cells. We make a lot of them. Uh, we, they, they don't last very long. They last about six hours in the circulation. But we need to make a huge number of them to keep us free of infection. When we treat patients downtown with very high dose chemotherapy, these patients are put into isolation. We have to have very good hand washing. We wear masks at times. And these patients, despite all those precautions, often get fever, get very ill from the very low levels of bacteria that are resonant on their skin or in their guts, levels of bacteria that we, we don't have any problems with because we have white blood cells. So with all this turnover, and this tissue always turning over, it can become malignant. And there's several different uh, categories of this type of malignancy. We, we say there's a spectrum of these disorders, um, and we have three, three of them. We'll talk about myeloproliferative disorders, mild dysplasia, and acute leukemia. And I'll show you some histologic slides to actually show you the difference here. This is a normal bone marrow. And, uh, what you need to know about this, all you really need to know, is that there's a lot of cells of different sizes and shapes. The big cells are the undifferentiated blood stem cells. And these cells here that look like horseshoes, those are cells that are almost mature white blood cells, ready to fight infection. And in normal bone marrow, what's happening is that the very immature stem cells, these big round ones, divide. And one of the daughter cells goes on its way to become a mature white blood cell. And one of the cells stays as an immature cell and can renew itself. By contrast, oh, it's a little fuzzy here. One thing you could see over here, this is myeloproliferative neoplasm. 
What you can see, get appreciation, is there's cells of different sizes and shapes here, but there's too many of them. So what happens in myeloproliferative neoplasms is this differentiation proceeds, but you just get too many cells. It's like the brakes are off. Very often this is associated with mutations and signaling pathways where the signals are always on. So the cells are always proliferating, and you get too many well-differentiated cells. These people, people like this can present with very high hemoglobin counts, so high that their blood almost sludges in the blood vessels and people can form spontaneous clots. Another type of disorder is called myelodysplastic syndrome. What you can sort of appreciate here, where all these cells are different sizes and shapes, we see an excess of cells of the large round type, but we do see some differentiated cells seen here. We will say here that these cells are partially blocked in their ability to form mature white blood cells, forming mature red cells. These patients present with low blood counts. They may need blood transfusions, they may need platelet transfusions, so they have too few uh, white blood cells and other blood cell lines. And finally, acute myeloid leukemia is characterized, see here all the different sizes and shapes. We Here we just see a lot of these cells, very big cells, a lot of unfolded light colored chromatin, and this is a big nucleolus, which is where ribosomes are, are made, <clears throat> ribosomal RNA is made. So these cells are really big. They're kind of almost, you know, kind of a lot of them look the same. This one, this one, this one, this one. They all kind of look the same. And this is because you, you basically have overgrown the bone marrow with this very early white blood cell that does not differentiate into a mature white blood cell. And patients like this can suffer symptoms from these white blood cells can infiltrate into tissues and can cause organ dysfunction, can cause bleeding in the brain, can cause liver failure, can cause kidney failure. And what all they also do is they crowd out the normal blood elements so you have too few normal white cells, you can get infected. Too many normal red cells and you get anemic. And too few platelets which are involved in blood clotting and you can spontaneously bleed. So how has this disease been classified over the years? I think this is an excellent example of how this set of diseases has been uh, classified with ever in finer uh, accuracy using a variety of more recent molecular techniques. Now the first kind of classification came about about 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, the French, American, British got together and say, when we take a look at these under the microscope, we have different patterns of, of cell morphology and we can classify these based upon seven different subtypes that we see under the microscope. And these are the seven different subtypes here. Uh, this one is very large cells, uh, not much cytoplasm. And as we go down here, we see this, these have these sort of pinkish granules. This is called acute promyositic leukemia. Uh, and over here we have uh, megakaryocytic leukemia where you have this very different looking cell. Over here you have erythroid leukemia. Well, this is very nice and good, and you can argue about this. We, we have uh, hematopathologists who become expert at this and can make the diagnosis. Unfortunately, this has very little prognostic information, other than these cases right here. If you see a case like this, these are patients who probably can be treated uh, with the vitamin A derivative retinoic acid and the heavy metal arsenic. There we go, chemistry again. And these patients can actually be cured probably without getting any conventional chemotherapy. Nowadays, though, we don't rely on that morphologic appearance to positively make that diagnosis. We have some tests that we can confirm this we'll talk about. But other than that, you know, other than that really standout example, this, mor this um, you know, morphologic classification, you could say patients got leukemia or they don't. But what type of leukemia? I, I need to know more information than just what it looks like under the microscope. So what was the first iteration to try to take these sets of diseases and further classify them? Came down to this, chromosomal spreads. Here using microscopic technology. When a cell divides and uh, the, the, the chromosome condenses, and forms a very tightly wound ball of chromatin, very tightly wound DNA around nucleosomes wound up in a solidinal coil in a very compact way. Each, uh, uh, each uh, the maternally inherited and paternally inherited allele line up at the metaphase plate, and then these chromatids split apart, 
in, in the daughter cells. Now, um, this is not the way the chromosomes look normally in the cell. This was done initially by taking pictures. You take cells from a patient, grow them a little bit in the lab and culture, and you make a, a metaphase spread, it's called. And then using low-tech Polaroid uh, technology, you take a picture, and then people used to sit there cutting out the, the photographs and pasting them on to make them look upright, and you'd have this set of chromosomes, the 23 uh, chromosomes and, the, and then the sex chromosome, 23 uh, pairs. Uh, nowadays, we have Photoshop to do that, right? You could just take a digital picture and you cut it out, and you, so there we have technology. There's math and engineering. You know, just cut it out, rotate it, flip it, do whatever. So now instead of doing a, a real scissor and paper cut, you could do a virtual cut, and so the technology advanced that way. Now, why is this important? Because in a variety of different types of leukemias, as well as many solid tumors, there are recurrent characteristic uh, translocations of chromosomal material, where one chromosome has broken, a part of the chromatin of the material has left one chromosome and joined another. These are at certain some some of these is what we call pathognomonic, uh, which a long word just means if you see this, this is what the diagnosis is. An example of this is chromosome translocation 922 which was the original chromosomal abnormality discovered in a cancer called the Philadelphia chromosome, discovered in about 1960 in Philadelphia at the Wistar Institute by Peter Knoll. This chromosomal translocation uh, is highlighted here using a certain technology called spectral karyotyping, in which each chromosome is painted with a specific uh, probe which hybridizes to sequences that are unique to each chromosome. And you can, you can uh, use various sets of, of probes to sort of distinguish each chromosome from one another by uh, the different colors merging together. So this is called spectral karyotyping to highlight the different chromosomes. But generally what's done by cytogeneticists is they look at these metaphase spreads, they, they virtually cut them out using Photoshop, and they look at it and they know what each chromosome should look like. It's got a stereotypical pattern. And they see a little bit of this chromosome missing and a little bit of this chromosome gaining, and they, you know, they can see with their eyes that's the 922. The spectral karyotyping shows that this blue uh, sequences here uh, have moved over here to the orange over there. That just confirms it. But this is not really, this is necessary for a research tool, but it's not generally done too often as a, as a diagnostic tool. So these translocations end up making fusion genes that encode fusion proteins. In the case of 922, it creates, takes a tyrosine kinase known as c able and fuses it to a gene that's otherwise obscure in function called BCR. This leads to the BCR fusion protein, which is a constituently activated tyrosine kinase that leads to phosphorylation of downstream substrates and basically turns the cell on all the time. This is the characteristic translocation of chronic myelogenous leukemia. Now, I think this set of discoveries will win the Nobel Prize in the coming years. I wouldn't be surprised if it would be this fall or the next fall. The discovery of a chromosomal translocation, the characterization of the, of the protein that is made by, the, the characterization of the protein that's made by it, and the discovery of a specific therapy to, as, as actually an antidote to the protein, namely a drug known as Gleveg or, or Amantinib. This uh, therapy has basically taken a, a uniformly fatal disease and turned it into a chronic disease where the median duration of survival used to be three years. Now no one knows what the median duration is because we have people living 10, 15 years and onward with the disease, with the disease kept in check with the specific therapy. So this kind of molecular analysis is absolutely essential to, fun, to, to discovering cures. Now the technology has been refined by a technology called fluorescence in situ hybridization. In this case, you take a DNA probe directed against the specific region of a chromosome, label it uh, with a fluorescent uh, uh, tag, and let it hybridize to its specific uh, piece of DNA in the chromosome. And you can do this on a metaphase spread, and you can see here uh, you have two alleles of one gene, two alleles of another gene, and here it looks like there's something wrong. There's two, uh, the two probes are mixed together. 
So if you had a chromosome probe for 9 and one for 22, you should normally have two dots here and two dots there. This patient looks like, in addition, this patient has, it looks like it still has two normal copies of 9 and 22, but then it's got a 922 fusion as well. So it had an extra, it had a chromosomal swap, and it looks like some, one of its normal chromosomes might have duplicated again. So that's, this is called a, um, a merge signal. And you don't even have to do this on a chromatin, uh, on a metaphase spread. You can do it during the interphase of a cell. In this case, if you have no translocation, you'll have two dots of green and two dots of red. And you can see uh, that over here. Here's um, two dots. Well, in this case, is a patient with disease. Well, here's two dots of green and two dots of red, I guess. But if you have a translocation, you'll get a merge. And so here we have two dots of red, one dot of green, and one merge. So this is called a, um, a merged probe. So we had a probe from chromosome 9 and 22, different colors. If the, the two segments, which are normally on two different chromosomes, are physically close to each other, you'll see the red and green through the fluorescent microscope will look like yellow. So that's called a merged probe. And we, this is routinely done by our cytogeneticists downtown to look for these translocations when it's very hard to grow the patient cells and you can't get the metaphases to occur. You can do it during the interphase so the cells don't have to be dividing. The other way to do this is what we call a split probe. You can have if you know that if, if previously characterized gene rearrangements, you might know that there's a chromatin segment that's broken apart. So what you have is you have a probe that consists of one part of the probe is labeled red and one part green. So they're so close to each other when they hybridize to the chromosome that they look as yellow. And if they break apart and become rearranged to some other part of the genome, then you get a green and red signal. Seen right here. So if there's no translocation, it's yellow. If they break apart, you see a separate uh, blue and red. And so these are so-called split signals. Here's a normal fusion signal right here, a normal fusion signal, and here's an aberrant split signal. So we have these merge probes and these split probes, and these are routinely used to diagnose whether or not an aberrant chromosome has rearranged, bringing two segments together, or two segments that should be together have broken apart. Now, this is a, you're very useful to see, say that a chromosome has broken, but how do you know which exact gene segments have broken apart or fused together? For that, uh, PCR technology became essential. And here's one example of a chromosomal translocation leading to a fusion protein called uh, core binding factor beta fused to MYH11. This is an odd fusion. This is a transcription factor, and this is myosin heavy chain. They normally have nothing to do with each other. But in uh, certain translocations in leukemia, these two genes get fused together, and that fusion protein has an aberrant effect on gene regulation and can stimulate leukemogenesis. If you want to detect this in a patient clinically and to follow it during the course of their disease, you design PCR primers with one primer uh, complementary to the myosin part and one part to the CBF beta part. And if you do this primer pair, in a normal person, you shouldn't see this fusion at all. But in a patient with this form of leukemia, you'll see a PCR product that's made by virtue of the fact that you take the RNA from this patient, reverse transcribe it into cDNA, and then you'll get a PCR that links this aberrant region with that aberrant region. And you can make it very sensitive by doing something that's called nested PCR. If, there's, if the cells are very rare, maybe one cell in 100,000, one cell in a million, if you do PCR, one, one set of aberrant DNA per million, you may not see this with one PCR reaction. So what you could do is a nested PCR where you start, let's say, with primers number three and five right here, take that product, uh, excuse me, take, take this product here, let's say one and three right here, and you would get a fusion, uh, a fusion product that includes all these sequences, but it may not show up because it's very, very few copies of it. Then you could do a second amplification with primers three and five here. We call that nested PCR, and this boosts the sensitivity. So you do two sets of PCR reaction with two different sets of primers. Two of them are outside and another two inside. And this can boost the sensitivity of the PCR reaction to detect even a very rare uh, cancerous cell amongst a whole bunch of normal cells. 
Now you could uh, use this type of uh, RT-PCR to detect fusions at, uh, at diagnosis or at relapse and to follow the patient's course of therapy. Here's a patient who has uh, had, a, had a fair number of, this is a case of a patient who had BCR ABLE, the CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia fusion. They had a bone marrow transplant, and you can see the transcript level drop down to almost undetectable. But then uh, the patient uh, had a, a relapse seen here. And when you get a bone marrow transplant, you suppress the immune system to prevent the incoming bone marrow from attacking the host. When you do that, however, the incoming bone marrow also doesn't attack the disease. So one strategy to fight this is to remove immunosuppression and let the incoming bone marrow and lymphoid system attack the disease. And what happened is the transcript level dropped, but then the patient had a relapse again. Then the patient got this uh, drug amantinib, also known as Gleevec generically, and the transcript level dropped. And then the patient relapsed again, and then the patient got amantinib and the transcript level dropped. This kind of, we do this routinely. We follow these BCR able transcripts by PCR. What we end up using is not the nested PCR, but we use real-time PCR using a machine that detects, um, you know, detects the PCR product as it's being made. And so we follow these in, in, in real-time by real-time PCR, and we make decisions based upon how's it going. If we have a patient who's been treated with amantinib and doesn't get a very good response to their transcript level, we might switch them to another drug. So these technologies are being used here and now to, to, to treat patients with uh, various leukemias. You take decades of work uh, together, you find that these chromosomal translocations and acute myeloid leukemia and rearrangements affect a, a really fair, num fair amount of the pie of, of acute myeloid leukemia. And these cases will be treated differently. These patients with retinoic acid receptor fusions will get retinoic acid. These patients with so-called RUNX MTG8, these are relatively good prognosis patients who may not get a stem cell transplantation. Patients with MLL tandem duplications, mixed lineage leukemia gene, the gene actually duplicates internally and adds a second part of sequences within itself and to make a really one big aberrant protein, those patients don't do well. We'll probably transplant those patients. So these chromosomal abnormalities that are annotated and you know, found in our cytogenetics lab, we use it all the time to make treatment decisions. But we're not really satisfied with this. Notice we have random mutate rearrangements that occur in one patient only. Hard to know what those mean. And some patients have no cytogenetic abnormalities whatsoever. We can't see any chromosomal uh, aberrancy, but the patient's got leukemia. Something's got to be wrong. What could be wrong? And just to, just to highlight one other thing about, about these cytogenetic subtypes, we know that there are three types of, uh, of, of acute myeloid leukemia, as I like to call it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the, the good patients have, there are three chromosomal translocations. Those patients do relatively well, though you can see at five years, there's only one third alive. That's still not great. These patients have a variety of losses of chromosomes, or what I fondly call scrambled chromosomes. They're, 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 uh, their karyotype's a mess. They have all kinds of chromosomal abnormalities. These patients basically don't respond, and they all die, unfortunately. And these patients are sort of in the middle. These include patients who have normal cytogenetics. We don't see any chromosomal abnormality. Some of those patients may do well, and some do poorly. And so this just flow chart shows that we have, you know, three groups. We have the poor prognosis patients. These do poorly with everything we do. We have the favorable. Some of these patients are only treated, like this group here, will only be treated with retinoic acid and arsenic nowadays, and they'll be cured. These patients in the middle, we don't always know what to do with them. So as you see over here, there's all these other names coming up here. These have to do with point mutations of genes, which further can subdivide the leukemia classes into different prognostic categories and different, different therapeutics should be used. So this also points to the further classification of acute leukemia by more modern technologies. And one of the first things to have been done about 1999, in fact, one of the first diseases to be profiled by microarray technology was acute leukemia. 
There are several different ways microarrays work. One of the early ways it was uh, done was to take normal uh, RNA from a normal tissue and from a tumorous tissue and to label it with a different fluorescent dye and to co-hybridize these RNAs to a cDNA probe that was spotted on a glass spa slide. If the gene is only expressed in normal, it'll be green. If it's only expressed in tumor, it'll be red. If it's expressed in both, it'll be yellow. So by scanning all these dots and quantifying the different color glow, you could determine if a gene is expressed in tumor, normal, both. And uh, you can do this for, uh, nowadays, every gene in the genome. In fact, every exon in the genome can be individually profiled at this point. So um, the advantages of microarrays now, they're pretty inexpensive now. We can do a microarray analysis um, a chip. The analysis, about $150, $200 a sample. Um, you get tw greater than 20,000 genes all at once, if you can figure out what to do with that information. And uh, there are some turnkey informatic approaches. There are programs that even I can't screw up now. So you can, you can sort of analyze this. Well, the early version, uh, I played with when I was a faculty member, and the tech support said they've never seen anything do, never saw anyone mess up the program as badly as I did. You know, I'm a very good mouse clicker, but that's about it. Um, bad things about arrays, you can only see what's on the array. If you don't put it on the array, you're not going to measure it. So it's only things you put on the array are the things you can measure. Um, Non-coding RNAs, microRNAs, these are, on, are not on conventional microarrays. And uh, it turns out that the, the, the physics and chemistry of this is when you do this hybridization and you're trying to count the number of RNA molecules, you get a compressed dynamic range. So things might change by 50%. In real life, they change five-fold. There's a compression of the dynamic range. So microarrays do not uh, adequately measure um, dynamic changes in gene expression. But uh, microarrays were first uh, up Applied to, uh, to, uh, uh, to acute leukemia in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Here's one example from Scott Armstrong where they took, uh, they found uh, sets of genes, blue means off and red means on. Acute lymphocytic leukemia had different genes on from acute myeloid leukemia. This was mostly a B cell uh, malignancy, that's a granulocyte malignancy. And there's an intermediate malignancy they called MLL, mixed lineage. It had aspects of both the granule sites and the lymphoid. So this is a way you can classify these leukemias and you can see there are different genes turned on and off and maybe those genes represent other therapeutic targets, pathways that might be, you know, might be uh, targeted. It turned out, and this is a seminal study almost 10 years ago now in the New England Journal of Medicine where there are about 15 different clusters by gene expression. This is about 400 specimens done at the, uh, the, in Rotterdam by uh, uh, the a Dutch group there, of course, in the Rotterdam. And they could find that some of these chromosomal, uh, some of these gene expression patterns had a very nice correlation with uh, chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, for example, translocation A21 here, 1517, which is the retinoic gas receptor here. But here's a whole pattern here which didn't, didn't segregate with any kind of chromosomal abnormality. So we could say that some of this gene expression changes in leukemia may be directly derivative of underlying molecular abnormalities, such as a chromosomal translocation. But some of it we couldn't explain at, at the time. Well, then you could also do this, the same data set you can sort of do with microRNA, and you can find that there's uh, different subsets, like here's the 1517, have a different set of microRNAs than the, the 821s over here. So you can also classify these leukemias by which microRNAs they have on and off. And again, these may be functional as well, that they may be controlling gene expression. <clears throat> Another technology you can use is we talked about uh, the expression of the genome. We're expressing RNAs, microRNAs, long non-coding RNAs. Underlying that are epigenetic changes, which is a big focus of our PSOC, of course. And a lot of those epigenetic changes are changes in DNA methylation. And you can actually profile DNA methylation by a microarray approach. Using methylation-sensitive or resistant enzymes, you can take DNA and you can cleave it with an enzyme that is uh, sensitive to DNA methylation, so it'll cut 
if the DNA is unmethylated or won't cut if it's methylated. You can take those DNA fragments and you can differentially label them with different colored probes. And if a site that's supposed to um, be labeled because it's, uh, it's cut is labeled when it's unmethylated, it won't be labeled when it's methylated, and you can basically get differential hybridization. So it's a basic idea, is that you make different sets of probes best, based upon whether or not the DNA is methylated or not, and you can detect which segment was methylated or not. So you can actually then classify these leukemias, not only by messenger RNA, microRNA, non-coding RNA, but you could tell which segments are methylated and which are not. And again, this gives additional prognostic information. A recent study showed that there were about 16 different methylation groups, some of which were never correlated with any chromosomal abnormality, and the analysis of those groups led to the discovery of further underlying mutations that were causing those methylation patterns. How else can we look at leukemia? Now there's a, this, I'll skip over that slide. But here, this is basically showing these different methylation patterns. Again, you see the PMLRER has a pattern, the H21 has a pattern. These patterns over here were not associated with any particular chromosomal abnormality. They're subsequently shown to be associated with mutations in the isocitrate dehydrogenase enzyme. This enzyme, when mutated, actually poisons DNA demethylases and leads to aberrant hypomethylation of genes. It was never known until uh, this kind of methylation pattern was seen. So now we have all these other ways of classifying leukemia. The, another technology that's brought to bear now is uh, cytogenetics by, by microarray. This is called copy number uh, analysis. It's based upon the notion that if you have a maternally inherited allele, it might have a polymorphism. We have polymorphisms on average, I think, every one million base pairs. And if we have three billion bases of DNA, that means we have three million polymorphisms. So you can make... Um, uh, microarrays that have specific differences at these known polymorphic sites. Uh, a probe on a microarray may have an A or a G. So a person may have AA, AB, or BB at this single nucleotide polymorphic site. If you take, uh, take genomic DNA, digest it, amplify it, and hybridize it to these arrays, you could get probes at any one site might pick up the A, A, B or both alleles. And you count that up. And what you do is you, you, you look at this analysis and you then count, did, did along a gene segment, uh, do I have a maternal and paternal? If yes, fine. What if I have two copies of maternal? What if I had three copies of maternal? This suggests that that region is amplified, that there could be a copy number variation and an amplification. And what if I lost the AA probes? That means I've lost that segment. So you, know, so you can count up regions of the genome that have been amplified or deleted by this copy number variation analysis. And one thing that came out of these types of analysis is the realization that our genomes are not only different in terms of the sequence identity, having a G or an A at a site, but each one of us have different copy numbers of some genes. Some of our genes are polymorphic in terms of how many copies we have. I might have, well, I have a lot. I'm not sure how many you have. <laughs> but we all have different copy numbers of certain genes. And this has to be subtracted from when we analyze tumors. And, 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 and ideally, when we're analyzing tumors to say, did a tumor have a copy number segment gain or loss, we have to have the same patient's normal tissue to make sure that that copy number gain or loss is not their natural variation from person to person. Um, so when you do this, you can actually profile leukemia, and this is a profile of all 23 uh, chromosomes and the X and Y looking at acute myeloid leukemia. And what's really kind of striking here is that this is all along the chromosome, and a red means an area of gain, and a blue means an area of loss. And when you take a look at acute myeloid leukemia, what's actually quite striking is that this is pretty quiet. There's not a lot of things going on here. We're not seeing lots of patches of bright red and lots of patches of deep blue, meaning that the, in general, acute myeloid leukemia is not characterized by a whole lot of chromosomal instability and huge shifts of chromosomes. 
a given patient may have a chromosomal rearrangement, but probably the rest of their chromosomes are pretty good. There are some of these bad actors who have the scramble chromosomes, but when you look across all the patients, we know about, a, about 25% have normal cytogenetics. We don't see anything, even at this microscopic level, which is looking at uh, gene rearrangements occurring as little as maybe uh, uh, 100,000 base pairs apart. It has that kind of resolution. We're not seeing much. So this was kind of a big surprise in some ways. Um, but you can discover some things. Here on chromosome 4, you can see A, B, A, B, A, B. And here's a loss. And this is a gene called TET2, which is lost in some patients with acute myeloid leukemia. So there has been some new gene discovery, uh, tumor suppressor gene discovery by this copy number array analysis. But it's been a little more fruitful in solid tumors than acute myeloid leukemia. Finally, we come up to the, to the, to the future and the here and now, which is genome sequencing. And this is, shows a, uh, the picture output of a, an early generation Illumina uh, high throughput sequencing array. This technology allows you to take DNA fragments and sequence millions of different DNA fragments from all at one time from, from, a, from a tumor source in what's called a shotgun approach. So you get these short segment uh, sequence reads of 25 to 50 base pairs. Now they're up to maybe 100 base pairs. And you take all the sequences. So I take the DNA from someone here mash it up into little pieces and sequence all of it, and then ask the computer to put it back together. Now, this was a remarkable, uh, this was actually Craig Ventner's idea, who uh, raced with the Human Genome Project to sequence the first human genome about the year 2000. The first human genome was sequenced at the cost of billion dollars plus. And Ventner's big innovation was to say, you guys are taking the wrong approach. You're just taking a little piece of DNA and walking along the chromosome and sequencing it, and that's going to take forever. My big idea is let's break it up into a million little pieces, sequence all of it, and put it back together by computer. And this was also done, eventually the, the Human Genome Project agreed with Ventner and did this as well, and it took heroic programmers at the University of California, Santa Cruz, the helm of the banana slug, to put this all together. And uh, you have the UC Santa Cruz browser, which basically is grew out of this reassembling of the genome from little pieces. Now, the first, uh, the first genome cost about a billion dollars. The first human uh, a a cancer genome was sequenced uh, by Tim Lay's group about five years ago in cytogenically normal acute myeloid leukemia. And that cost about $2 million. So we went down about 1,000 fold. This uh, discovery was a remarkable discovery, but what was really puzzling about this is there were about 200 mutations found in this patient's leukemia that differed from their normal skin fibroblasts. But they were found in no other patient with acute leukemia they went back and sequenced. So what the heck is going on here? What are these mutations? Well, what they've subsequently done is they've taken normal blood cell colonies from babies, middle-aged people, and older people, and if you take a single colony and you sequence it, you find that as you get older, your cells develop mutations and accumulate mutations. And on that one terrible day that this person had a normal blood cell turned into leukemia, every mutation that that cell had accumulated to that date got frozen and got replicated along with the with malignant clones. So these we will call passenger mutations. They're non-recurrent. They may have some biologic effect, but in most cases, they probably just are long for the ride. Now, the second uh, couple of genomes sequenced by Tim Lay's group found a new mutation in isocitrate dehydrogenase. Uh, this gene is mutated in about 10 or 15 percent of cases of acute leukemia. So this is one of the first examples of a new cancer-causing gene discovered by sequencing the whole genome of a cancer patient saying the new mutation occurred in the cancer patient, but not in their normal germline. And subsequently, uh, Lay's group found DNA methyltransferase mutations, very interesting because this is a major enzyme that affects DNA methylation and epigenetic regulation. This is a recurrent mu uh, mutation. Similarly, a group in, in, in China uh, found this as well. And this is important because these patients with the mutations do pretty badly compared to patients without the mutations. 
In fact, recent evidence suggests that we should be changing therapy based upon the presence or absence of this mutation. So now we have a pie chart of leukemia. We had translocations as classifying acute myeloid leukemia. Now we have mutations in these genes, FLT3, a tyrosine kinase, 37%, DNA methyltransferase in a quarter, nucleophosmin another quarter, and these others that are less common. Uh, many of these uh, are encoding activating uh, mutations that activate oncogenes, and some of these are actionable. We may have therapies directed against them. And some of these are uh, disabling mutations in tumor suppressor genes, allowing the leukemia to the cells to get out of control and posing a challenge for us in terms of how to therapeutically target them. So, as I said, the first genome was a billion dollars. The first genome, okay, well, my mistake. First cancer genome was a million dollars. Currently, a genome is about $20,000. And if you just want to sequence the 2% of DNA that encodes um, protein, so-called exome, that will cost you about $1,000. But data analysis and storage remain costly. In fact, I uh, heard an estimate from one uh, computational biologist that if you just decide to sequence the genomes of every newborn child in the United States this year and you wanted to store it, it would take something like 10 yottabytes. And what's a yottabyte? A yottabyte is, uh, I think it's a billion terabytes. And if a terabyte costs about $100 or something like that, or it's a trillion terabytes, if a terabyte now is about $100 for a terabyte hard drive, it's a little less now, maybe it's, but let's say it was $100, you would have to turn the state of New Jersey, Delaware, and parts of Maryland into a server farm to store the data, and it would cost more money than there exists on the planet Earth to store this data. So we have a problem here. <laughs> Until, you know, stored data storage, I have a problem right now. The university wants to back up all my computers. Thank you, university. Who's paying for it? Um, you know, so we have, you know, we have like 10 terabytes of data from our own, you know, not genome, just exome and RNA sequencing, and we have problems with that. So let me just turn to the last thing here, which is, which is RNA sequencing, which is now supplanting microarray for several things. Here we simply are taking poly A RNA, or if you want to look at uh, small RNAs, you can have special uh, procedures to isolate small microRNAs, convert them into a cDNA, add an adapter, uh, do some limited amount of amplification, and either you sequence it from one end or you sequence it from both ends. And these machines just keep on getting better and better. Now you can get paired end sequencing, and you can get 20 million reads for you know a couple hundred dollars now. So really, it's coming down to commodity prices. And basically, you take these RNA-seq reads, and by computer, you align them to the genome, and you can uh, actually find uh, uh, transcripts if they're more or less abundant. You can find uh, novel fusion transcripts. If you have a fusion, if you have some kind of cryptic chromosome rearrangement making a fusion transcript, you'll find a gene from over here gene over there and you find a fusion RNA, particularly if you do these paired end reads. And what it actually looks like is you take the, the genome and here are the sequence reads and you get these, you know, these pileups here and this will be one exon, this will be another exon, that could be another exon and so forth. So that's how the reads actually look. The good ideas of this is uh, uh, you, can, um, you can detect uh, uh, mutations. You can detect uh, uh, gene expression mutations and fusion genes all in one analysis. So if I have a very rare portion, a very little bit of tumor uh, DNA or a tumor sample, and someone asks me, how would I analyze it? If I had only one thing to do, I can only do one procedure, I'd probably do RNA-seq because I have a chance of detecting mutations, uh, aberrant gene expression, and uh, fusion genes. So this comes down to the era now that we'll call personalized medicine or precision medicine, the notion that you can direct anti-cancer agents depending upon your genotype, which means which chromosomes are rearranged, which genes are deleted or amplified, which genes are mutated. Uh, this is the idea. And uh, some, some of the ways you can do this now rapidly are be, be RNA-seq or exome sequencing. And the question for us downtown is a classic question of buy it or build it. Should we buy it or should we build it? 
And if we buy it, you have an instrument like this called the ion torrent, where you can uh, resequence uh, subsets of genes fairly rapidly. Of course, the problem with these machines is by two years from now, they're very pretty paperweights. And uh, you know, they, they get become outmoded very rapidly. Uh, they require upkeep costs, and there, there, there are concerns about owning these things. The other kinds of things, not an advertisement, I have no commercial interest, is outfits like this, Foundation Medicine, that were based upon the genomics group at Dana-Farber, and they, they founded a company with the idea now is you can take even a, a fresh frozen, par, a, a fixed paraffin embedded tissue from a, from a slide, and Dr. Kolesna will be talking about histology, take that slide and scrape off the DNA, send it to them, and they'll sequence, you know, thousands of genes and look for mutations that might be actionable. And this is where it's going. We have patients now that we're sending samples out. Uh, some mutations we detect in our own laboratory, some we don't have the capability, we send it out, and we will change action based upon these uh, mutations that are found. So that, I think, gives you kind of a, an evolution of uh, of personalized precision medicine as seen by my viewpoint as someone who's been interested in acute leukemia and I, as you can see how with each passing year uh, there might be a new technology that I haven't even imagined yet that might be coming up next. But as you can see we're getting more precise in our diagnosis, classification, prognostic uh, predictions and eventually in changing our therapies to direct the right uh, agents to the right patients. And I'll be happy to take any questions before our next speaker. Thank you.